All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Safer Sim webinar. Today's web webinar is examination of driver behavior in response to bicyclist behaviors. And Kara Hammond from the Department of Epidemiology at the University of Iowa will be presenting. I'll let her take over from here. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, this is Kara, and Toyosi Soni is here with me as well. She's actually going to start off the presentation for us, so I'm going to pass it over to her. Here's Toyosi. Hi, everyone. Um, this is Toyosi. Um, as I'm introduced, we will be presenting um, a research on examining driver behavior in response to bicyclist um, behavior. Um, we'll start by giving a brief introduction, and then um, I'll be selected at events. We'll go on to describe our events and give the results and the conclusions and recommendations. Um, so first, bicyclists are vulnerable road users, and um, they are not as protected as motor vehicles on the road. And um, when a bicyclist crashes and a motor vehicle is involved, the risk of fatal injury is increased. And um, previous research also shows that when there's um, hospitalization, there's an increased burden resulting from um, higher cost and longer stays in the hospital. And um, as a means to prevent injuries and improve road safety, bicycle infrastructure is being used to um, separate motor vehicles from bicyclists. The aim of this study is to examine the behavior of drivers and to um, identify how age bicycle infrastructure influences the interactions between motorists and bicyclists. And we had three specific research objectives. Our first objective was to conduct a literature review and to identify the gaps in um, literature and to um, also identify common bicycle motor vehicle crash types. We also wanted to um, analyze a naturalistic data set to identify safety critical events and to examine interactions between bicyclists and motor vehicles. And um, the purpose of this is to inform the design of our um, simulation events. For our naturalistic data sets, we captured um, the we captured the bicycling trips of adults and children using a GPS enabled camera. Um, the results showed that about 94% of our events were due to traffic violations, and this included um, failure to stop or yield, incomplete stops, and um, reckless driving and riding against traffic and we also found out that most of these violations occurred at intersections and um, another event that was very common was the overtake event for the literature review we identified common um, bicycle motor vehicle crash types and characteristics and we found out that most of these events occurred at intersections um, they occurred when a motorist was overtaking a bicyclist and um, also at mid block sections and um, for a right hook type, and the right hook type is um, the picture on the right hand side. And we identified the contributing factors that um, contributed to those crashes. And some of the factors that we found included um, failure to observe the bicyclist, um, attention, um, poor judgment of passing distance, um, some built environment issues were also found lighten. For, um, we identified several gra gaps in literature and um, these three events were very common. The first one was how shed lane markings impacted the passing distances between motor vehicles and um, bicyclists. Um, another gap that we found was um, not many research has been done to identify how it respond to female bicyclists we found some literature that drivers gave more passing distances when the bicyclist was a female but we did not find a lot of research make certain of these claims we also found gaps such as um, bicycle infrastructure like bicycle lanes and trail crossing and their impact on um, driver behaviors on the road for we identified um 
the selection of our events based on these parameters. One was how likely a crash would occur and the risk of injury, the frequency with which an event occurred and um, the gaps that we found in literature. We also selected some limitations within our simulation and um, study design. This study was part of a larger Toyota study and um, there were some events that could not be nested in in the larger study and some events that could not be recreated were also removed from the final selection of our three um, events. Our final events were an overturned with a shared lane marking and without a shared lane marking. It was a right turn across path when the bicyclist is traveling straight and the um, motorist is turning to the right. The third event was a um, crosswalk event when the um, bicyclist is traveling on a bike path and crosses in front of the motorist and the motorist is um, traveling straight. Um, we enrolled 59 participants, although 48 completed the study. 11 participants were removed as a result of um, and, um, performance issues. Our inclusion criteria included having a valid driver's license and being able to complete the um, study timeline. And our exclusion criteria were medical exclusions like heart condition, pregnancy, and any kind of um, serious illness. We categorized our age into four categories, which were the novice group, the young group, the middle group, and the older adults. We will now go into the second part of this presentation, which would be presented by Kara Haman. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Toyosi. Yes, I'm going to start off here uh, giving you a little more description of the events that we chose. And as Toyosi um, mentioned, we were limited. We only were able to test three events because we were limited by adding these events to a larger study. So. Um, we wanted to capture the events that were most or test the events that were most common uh, and most commonly problematic as well and from the literature and from what we saw in our naturalistic data set so first our first event was an overtaking um, event the bicyclist was traveling forward the over the motorist overtakes the bicyclist from behind uh, you can see from the graphics there one one group of drivers group uh, received, uh, they saw the event where there were no shared lane markings present and the other group did have shared lane markings present. So we wanted to look at the difference in how they overtook the bicyclist uh, with and without the shared lane markings. Um, there was one other difference given that this was nested in a larger study and due to the counterbalancing of all the different events that were included in the larger study, the drivers in the group that had the shared lane markings encountered this event when they were traveling from urban to residential areas to the residential area and it was opposite in the group markings. The roadway segment was the same. It's basically a connector road between the urban and residential area. It was just that they were traveling in the opposite direction. So here, here's an example from our naturalistic data uh, this is a similar roadway to what we tested in the simulation um, event. And this is, I just wanted to show you kind of what we saw in the naturalistic data that we found was a bit interesting. So here, one car overtakes. And then the same roadway a little bit later, this car overtakes and you can see they pass much closer. I'm going to play it one more time so you can see this a little bit better. So notice the center line and where this car is positioned to the left of that crack in the road. And here they're much closer and there's an, also an oncoming car. So their timing there is really interesting. Um, and you'll also notice neither one of those drivers gave the bicyclist the whole lane. They didn't change lanes completely to pass the bicyclist. So we had a few things we wanted to look at uh, in our simulation. Here's what it looks like in the simulator with with the shared lane markings and, and without. And we wanted to know how much distance drivers gave and also um, how actually changed lanes to pass the bicyclist. Our second event was right turn across path or uh, this crash typology is known as a right hook and it's pretty common. 
Uh, drivers were instructed to take a right turn at, the, at this intersection when they approached it, and this is in an urban area. When they got to the intersection, the light was red, so they had to stop. They would they have to pass the bicyclist before they stop, and then right when the light turns green, the bicyclist is right at that stop line, So, and the bicyclist is going straight through the intersection, so the car had to wait for the bicyclist, otherwise they would hit them. And here's what that looks like in the simulator. Turn right at the next intersection. Turn right now. So they see the bike, or the light turns green right there. They have to wait for the bike to cross. And then they continue on their way. And then finally, our third event was a bike path crossing. Here, the driver's traveling forward. The bicyclist is on a multi-use bike path, uh, and they cross perpendicular in front of the motorist coming from the right. You can see in the graphic there's a fence in the way there. We found a lot of times in our naturalistic data when people were riding on bike paths that crossed uh, mid-butt crossings through residential areas, there would often be visual obstructions like fences or bushes, or even when the path goes between and the houses would obstruct that line of vision between the car and the, and the bike. So we wanted to look at driver performance related to um, this type of event. And here's, here's an example clip from our naturalistic data of, of what inspired this event. So here's a path. This is a, a residential area, very low traffic. Bo both the bike path and the roadway are low traffic. And this particular participant, this is a trip to work. And they ride this route almost every day. And uh, oftentimes, they don't. They barely slow down, and I think they're used to hardly ever encountering a car there. So one of the things that we were interested in is what would happen uh, from the driver's perspective when they do encounter, by, encounter a bicyclist, because oftentimes at those type of crossings, the traffic's low. Uh, so most of the time it's okay, but when, when they do have the timing where they encounter each other um, at the same time, that's when a problem could occur. And then here's what this looks like in the simulator. So still a residential area. This is obviously from the driver's perspective instead. There's the visual obstruction. There's the bicyclist crossing. And this one, the car didn't really even slow down there. Um, so, and it was kind of, um, you couldn't really tell if they, 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 you didn't see a clear reaction, at least from watching it, of, of, uh, to that bicyclist popping out. So let's go to results. Uh, for the overtaking event, uh, in the shared lane marking, we found that none of the drivers had closest approaches, closest approach distances less than three feet, while uh, 37 and a half no shared lane arrows group. Uh, approached less than had closest approaches less than three feet. You, are you wondering why we're talking about three feet? Well, in the U.S., a lot of states have enacted legislature uh, legislation that requires drivers to give bicyclists at least three feet when they're passing. Uh, and actually, in Iowa, where we are here, the uh, law set, just says that drivers should give bicyclists a safe distance, so it's really vague. Uh, the last legislative session, actually, there was, um, they tried to put through a change that would require drivers to change lanes to pass bicyclists, but that didn't go in the House, and so that didn't go through. So we were also just interested in this to see what are, how much space are drivers giving bicyclists when they pass. Um, and here you can see the mean closest approaches. So in the shared lane marking group, the average was 5.7 feet. And in the no shared lane marking group, it was 4.1. So the average was greater than three feet. But like I said, 
37 and a half percent of the drivers in that no shared lane marking group gave less than three feet at some time during the overtaking. So here's a graphic graphic of what that overtaking looked like. So in here you can see uh, on the left is the group where the shared lane arrow, the shared lane markings were present. The bicyclist tra uh, trajectory is the green line, and they're traveling from the left to right on the screen. <laughs> and you can see the two circled areas are the places where people uh, overtook the bicyclist. On the right-hand side of the screen, the, bic the bicyclists and cars are traveling the opposite direction. So like I mentioned earlier, they, they encounter these events at, at, in the opposite direction in, during the drive. And you can really see a difference. Um, the overtaking, they had much more um, defined, like less less subtle movements around the bicyclist in that group. And so really it it kind of gives you a visual of how the group that had the share lane markings really had better positioning throughout the entire event. They they seem to anticipate the bicyclist better and, and just kind of have a more gradual overtaking, uh, less, less abrupt overtaking. So um, some more results for this event. Novice drivers, and we define that as 18 to 25 years old. We didn't have a, we only had 18 and older drivers in this study. Uh, in the no shared lane marking group, had greater max deceleration values compared to the other age groups. So they um, slowed down more abruptly, and we didn't find the same difference in the shared lane marking group. So again, it, the, having those shared lane markings there seemed to improve um, just kind of calm everything down and make everything more smooth transition and we also found that the total time spent on a collision course with the bicyclist was higher the amount of the amount of time on a collision course was higher in the sh no shared lane marking group four seconds average versus less than a second 0.1 seconds in the um, shared lane marking group so again that illustrates the better positioning we also interestingly found that older drivers, so 61 to 80 years old in the no shared lane marking condition, gave less average passing distance. Um, their average passing distance as a group was 2.8 feet in the no shared lane markings group versus 5.8 feet, so almost twice as much there um, in the when the shared lane arrows were present. So the shared lane markings really seem to improve positioning, especially in that older driver group. And, but overall, among all drivers, um, the position, their positioning was better on the bicyclists and they gave more space throughout the event. And getting back to that point of, I mentioned in Iowa, our legislation trying to, trying to change to have drivers make a complete lane change, we wanted to look at that as well. And we found that over 80% of participants in out of all the participants in both groups did not make a complete lane change. So it was pretty, pretty rare to, to really completely change lanes to pass the bicyclist. Okay, moving on to right turn across path event. We found that the mean wait time decreased with age. So the time they spent waiting at that stop line for the bicyclist to pass through the intersection before they could make the right turn, uh, that time decreased with age. And we were not exactly sure the mechanism there. It seemed that um, the older drivers, or as you got older, maybe it was either that people just had more finesse or more more skill in how to time their their, goal, or maybe they had less patience. We're not sure. <laughs> um, and we also found that closest approaches did not vary significantly by age or gender. So the space they gave the bicyclist didn't seem to, to change by age or gender. We didn't see any collisions. We didn't have any hard accelerations in the turn. Uh, we did find that the glance reaction time, so 
in that event when they pass the bicyclist and then they stop and when they see the bicyclist come through again, that glance reaction time was a little bit longer for males, but it wasn't significantly different. Um, and we also found that the mean and the minimum speeds throughout the event uh, were higher, they increased with, with age. Okay, for the bike path cross, we found that all, hardly any of the participants, so um, 98 participants, or of all the participants, were not on a collision course with the bicyclist at any time during the event. And only, only one participant had a value for had was on a collision course at, at any point in time. So really this we people didn't have a problem in terms of collision courses with the bicyclists for this event. We didn't have any collisions and we didn't have any lane departures. So people didn't have to move out of their lane to um, to respond to the bicyclist in this event. Uh, we did find that the maximum brake forces were higher in the middle and older age groups compared to the novice and young age groups. Uh, and you can see the values there. So for no, so as the age got older, the brake forces got higher. Uh, and max deceleration was greater than or equal to 4 Gs in 20, almost 21% of the participants. Most of those participants were in the middle or older age groups. So it seemed that the reaction in terms of braking was a little um, better in the younger age groups. And that the video clip we showed you earlier, I believe that was a young driver. And you and as I mentioned, they they really didn't seem to slow down. They just they kind of timed it out, um, so they didn't need to brake. So kind of in conclusion here, uh, we. Really, some of the main findings as we pull them out is that the shared lane markings, so we were, I have to admit, we were a bit surprised at, at the differences we found. We, did, we weren't convinced that it, um, they would have this much of an impact. And we learned from the literature review that results really are mixed on shared lane markings. So that is one of the reasons we wanted to look into this further. But we found that we, they really did result in more passing distance in for everyone and particularly were helpful for older drivers. Uh, people had better positioning and their people in the novice age group uh, had softer braking. And overall through these events, we found that novice, the, the youngest and the oldest age groups uh, had the most variation uh, compared to the other age groups. And we thought, um, we think this suggests that more research should be done looking at age differences uh, for all, all types of uh, evaluation of bicycle infrastructure and driver performance. We also found overall that gender didn't really have a significant relationship um, with driving performance. And we thought that was an important finding as well. So future research directions, we think that Additional research should be done on the comparative effectiveness of, of these bicycle specific treatments and how, for example, how shared lane markings perform compared to other uh, infrastructure improvements and pavement treatments and how driving performance varies uh, with among those different treatments and how they vary by age group. And we also found that it was very helpful using the naturalistic bicycling data to inform how we built our, our events and how we chose them, but particularly on the development side of what kind of features, like the visual obstruction, for example, uh, we found at the, like I said before, with the trail crossings, there was a lot of visual obstruction. And this is something that you really wouldn't necessarily reveal from crash data or other existing data sources, the little nuances. And we also think that future research should include uh, looking at driver performance for drivers less than 18. That was a limitation of our study. And we, all the bicyclist avatars in our events were female. We think it would be interesting to look at the difference between female and male avatar 
bicyclists, uh, which we were not able to add to this study, but it, something to do in the future. Um, and with that, I want to acknowledge our funding, which came from the Safer Sim University Transportation Center, the Injury Prevention Research Center, and we had to make this study possible from Toyota Motor Company. And that is all. And we'd, we'd love to answer any questions anyone has. Okay, I see a question from Justin. Uh, could you talk more about your naturalistic data collection? Yes, um, we we kind of breezed through that. I I'm aware. <laughs> um, we we collected data from 20 bicyclists. So there was 10 adults and 10 children. We asked them to record their bicycling one week each, and we collected about 57 hours of data. Uh, this was really it is a wealth of data but it really was a pilot version we've since collected some more but that wasn't related to this particular study but we we just really found it it fruitful and and it has a lot of information that just is not available from other sources let me know if you want what other things you might want to know about it Uh, Aaron, thanks for your question, Aaron. Um, what was the forward speed of the bicycle? It was, I believe it was about 12 miles per hour, if I remember right. I don't have it right on the tip of my tongue, but we'll check into that. Give us a minute. <laughs> and, oh, Justin says, did you use instrumentation? So we used a GPS enabled helmet camera. If you look back to, let me, I can go back in our slides and show you what it looked like. We used a helmet camera. Sorry, I'm flipping through these. Right here. So it was a camera with GPS capability mounted to the bicyclist helmet. Oh, uh, we found the speed of the bicyclist was 15 kilometers per hour. <laughs> Any other questions? Don asks, are there any ideas for distributed simulation studies? Yes, definitely. Um, we're not sure what, dire what direction we want to go, but we definitely like the idea of incorporating the naturalistic data again. Uh, as you can see, the naturalistic data, we, we took it and created a driving simulation study, but obviously it it's directly from the press. So it would be excellent to do a study where we have both a bicycling simulator and a driving simulator and have those connected. So yes, that's absolutely something that we would want to do in the future. Okay, so Justin asked, um, and we did not cover that, but he asked what proportion of traffic violations were riders versus drivers. So we only captured a really small percentage. I can't, I don't know what it is right this second. It's, it's really small of driver violations. The way we, the way our coding protocol was set up for the natu naturalistic data, it really was capturing the, the bicyclist behavior. So it was capturing traffic violations by the bicyclist. And we only coded driver violations or 
driver errors if in the net and again i'm talking about the naturalistic data if they had a direct impact on the bicyclist so for example if the bicyclist had to brake or swerve um, and those those type of events were really rare but we didn't we didn't have in our protocol to code just any type of motorist error like if they didn't um, make a complete stop at a stop sign um, that type of thing um, oh do we have the um Aaron asked do we have the hardware to do that and I'm assuming you mean the distributed simulation and we do have bicycling pedestrian and driving simulators we have we have not yet done a distributed simulation study but we are i know things are in the works so the, that will be forthcoming okay someone asked how do you think drivers would respond to the simulated scenarios if they themselves regularly bike compared to drivers that don't that is a really good question. And in hindsight, we really wish we would have asked the drivers from our study if they regularly, or how much they bike or if they bike, because we, we do think that could have a, a good a impact on, on how they perform in these type of events. So limitation of this study, but something to consider in the future for sure. And Stacy asked the question about cycling experience. Um, again, I really wish we we would have we would have asked that. Okay, uh, Tim, you say was there limit was there limitations on time of day and or weather conditions when the data was collected? Were there any particular times of day uh, where errors violations were more common? Um, and I assume you're talking about the naturalistic data. So there were we did not have any limitations on time of day or weather. The with one exception, the only weather condition restriction or limitation was we asked them not to record trips if it was pouring rain. And from what we could tell from our data, uh, no one chose to ride when it was pouring rain anyway. So we don't believe we missed any trips um, due to that. But we asked them to record all their trips even if it was in the middle of the night, which we did get a few of those. Um, most of our um, generally times of day, we, they were mostly kind of um, just during the regular day hours, like work work day hours, and same with the weekend. So kind of correlated with when people mostly bike anyway. Don asks, did we see any incidents between bicyclists and pedestrians? And yes, in the naturalistic data, we did have a few incidents where the, uh, especially among the children, we found that children really rode uh, much more on sidewalks than adults did. And among the children, we had a couple incidents where the child was riding on the sidewalk and there were pedestrians and they, we had one case that I can remember clearly where the pedestrian basically had to jump out of the way of the bicyclist um, because they were kind of swerving and, and almost hit, hit the pedestrian. Um, and can we get a copy of the presentation? Yes, I think so. Um, 
I will share it with the uh, safer sim powers that be, and they can pass it out. <laughs> I'm happy to share. Oh, there, Don says the recording will be available online. Oh. Tim asks where where was the data gathered and it was the naturalistic data was all in Johnson County, Iowa. So that includes Iowa City where where the university is and the simulation study was conducted in the National Advanced Drive, Driving Simulator also on the University of Iowa campus. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you to everyone who uh, joined us for this presentation and for all your excellent questions. And we're happy to answer more via email. Um, so look us up if you have more questions. <laughs>